Welcome to the November the 14th, 1989 taping of It Happened in Grand Prairie. As we bring you back the memories of Grand Prairie, Texas, and also we bring those people that made those important things happen to Grand Prairie and let you know what they're doing today. This is our history tape number 107, our 107th taping of important history of Grand Prairie. And we are just so delighted today to welcome Mr. Amos Turner and his wonderful wife, Mary. Welcome to the show, Turners. Thank, Thank you. you. We are just so privileged to have people of your importance coming to our show to help us document the history of Grand Prairie, Texas. And first of all, let's begin with Mr. Amos Turner. And Mr. Turner, would you look out into your camera and give us your genealogy. Give us your father's full name and your mother's full name and maybe even your brothers and sisters if you'd like to talk a little bit about those. Well, father's full name was Marvin Turner. Mm -hmm. uh, mother's name was Dora Luella. Hal Turner. Okay. I don't really think you want me to go through my brothers and sisters. I had eight brothers and three sisters. So that would be quite lengthy if I went through all of them. So I came from a very large and loving family. All right. Now, your large and loving family uh, that you were born to this union of Marvin and Dora. Where were you born, Amos Turner? Jacksboro, Texas. Jacksboro, Texas. Se Semi West Texas, between Wichita Falls and Fort Worth. All right. Now, being born into the Turner family with all of these wonderful brothers and sisters, where did you fit in line with all of these others? You were son number or child number what? I was child number 11. I was the last of the line. You were the baby and very spoiled, I'm sure. And tell us a little bit about your parents and where did Amos Turner, where was he born in this area and what did your parents do for a living? My father was an agricultural man, a farmer. For all of his many years, he came from an agricultural family. Originally, they came from Ellis County. Okay. Uh, his father was a farmer on a vast amount of acreage southwest of Waxahachie, and uh, he was a he fought the Civil War and he migrated to Texas after the Civil War and set up farming down there. He was also a, a master brickmaker, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I never knew him. He was deceased long before uh, I came along, and uh, they. He had a very large family. Also, I had uh, 10 uncles and aunts on my father's side, so plus numerous cousins. So uh, my father migrated to Jacksboro in the late 1890s. I uh, had uh, three brothers and sisters that were born in Ellis County. The rest of us were born in Jack County. So he farmed in Jack County for, uh, well, numerous years, uh, many, many years before he passed away in the late 1940s. All right, now Amos Turner, where did you start to school as a young man? I started at Jacksboro. I went through all, well, I take it back. I started a very small rural one teacher school. Let's name that. Martin Chapel. All right. And, and uh, the people who aren't familiar, they probably don't know where Martin Chapel is. It's between Jacksboro and Possum Kingdom Lake. That might give a clue as to where it is. All at, right. at that time, it was a, a community, all the rural people from miles around. Uh, Myself, my older brothers walked or rode horses five miles to and five miles for the first three years of my schooling. Then later on, we moved into Jacksboro, and I finished my elementary and secondary schooling there. All right. Now, when you lived on the farm, did you ever have any farm chores, Mr. Turner? Many, right? many, many. All right. Yes. Uh, tell the boys and girls that uh, uh, that audit our tapes that are studying the history of Grand Prairie. Tell us what what happened to. Well, it. these youngsters now they uh, they have no comprehension of what farm life was back in those days. All right. There was no mechanization of any sorts. Everything was done by stock animals, horses, teams of horses, teams of mules. Of course, all farms had milk cows and raised their own hogs and poultry and this type of thing. And uh, we planted, well, of course, we had plows that we used the teams to plow with, and uh, later the, the planters that we planted with, and the cultivators and the other things to cultivate the crops. And uh, No big tractors. Uh, no big tractors. No big tractors. Teams of mules or horses. And uh, you either walk behind them, or if you were fortunate, you might get to ride on a cultivator or something that had a seat on it. But most of the work was done by walking. And then all of it was manual labor. You hand pick the cotton, no such thing as cotton pickers. Mm -hmm. You hold or chop the cotton, as we call it, mm -hmm. to get the weeds out and thin it out after it was first coming up to uh, 
cultivate the, the land where it would grow and keep the weeds, keep it weed free, where you could get in and pick it later on once it matured. And we raised many types of grains, wheat, oats, uh, maize, the feeds that uh, go into making the silage for the animals during the winter. And that, of course, was stacked in big stacks to feed. Of course, the grain was thrashed in thrashing machines that traveled throughout the country that uh, people followed them, much like they do now, except they have combines now. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was all done with the uh, uh, wagons and horses, and, and uh, you pitched the bundles up at the wagons, they took them to the thrashing machine, and they thrash separated the seed from the, the rest of the stuff that uh, was discarded or turned into silage. All right, so, now when Amos Turner went to school in Jacksboro, you were in the fourth grade then, beginning there? Beginning in the fourth grade, correct. Mm -hmm. All right, and tell, tell me a little bit about going to Jacksboro to school, and as you went on into the secondary school, maybe your favorite teacher, what your interest was, and, and when you graduated. Well, I graduated in 1935. Of course, back in those years, we only went 11 grades, and mm -hmm. I started when I was young. I graduated from high school when I was barely 16 years of age. So I was not nearly mature enough, even though uh, I came from a very competitive family, uh, very athletically inclined, all of us, even uh, though we were all were taught and had to work hard. I was expected back in those days. Uh, mm -hmm. There was uh, always plenty to do. And uh, the difference then and now in attending school, attending school then was a privilege. If you didn't want to attend school, you didn't have to. There was plenty of work to do on the farm. Mm -hmm. So you had your choice, you'd go to school or you work. So that was an incentive for going to school, whereas now it's a chore, something that's demanded of children. And uh, I kind of have a hard time of accepting these, this new philosophy that we have. To me, it still should be a privilege, because education is definitely a privilege. And it's something for every youngster now, for back then it wasn't. Uh, many, many children had no opportunity to get a, a secondary education. Most of them went through seventh or eighth grade, and that ended. In fact, most of my family uh, went through the eighth grade. That was the only formal education I had. Now, my two brothers, older than myself, did go to college, but uh, we were the only one. So, uh, it, uh, and then, of course, the Depression came on about that time. It was, it was not an easy time. Uh, Work-wise, jobs became very, very scarce. Money was even more scarce. So, uh, it was a most, most difficult time for, uh, not only my family, but all families. All Every, right. It, all the families were having a hard time back then. All right, now talk about high school. And you're getting out of high school. We have your date, you graduated in 35. Uh, did you graduate with a scholarship or what happened to Amos Turner after that? Well, I was out of school for one year. I, uh, I wasn't large enough to get in type of scholarship. And uh, back then, scholarships were not available like they are now. Mm -hmm. And you earned scholarships then. You went to school and earned them. And uh, I was not the best of students. Uh, I was too wrapped up in athletics. Uh, I played all sports in high school, and uh, later that for had been good stead. I stayed out of school one year and worked on a farm. In fact, a, a cotton patch caused me to get a college education. Mm -hmm. When I started picking that cotton in the frosty November mornings, I thought to, there must be an easy way to make a, a living in this world than doing this. So I made up my mind the following year I was going to college one way or another. And, uh, so I managed to scrape together a little money and go to school and you know, work for a scholarship in football and earn it the first year. Then uh, for the last three and a half years, I was on an athletic scholarship, played football and basketball both in college. And, uh, you didn't tell uh, us the name of that wonderful college. Trinity University. It was at Walks Hatch at that time. All right. It's uh, top, one of the top-ranked schools in the nation today, scholastic-wise. It's now, of course, it moved to San Antonio shortly well, during the war years, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm still closely associated with it. I have friends who are, well, most of them retired and they taught down there, went there. But we have two reunions a year. I'm still very close to my college teammates that I played football and basketball with. And uh, so it is a, a real fine liberal arts college. It ranks in probably the top three or four percent in the United States. It's uh, up there with the, with the elite. And it was tough then. Those, those classics were very tough. To graduate from Trinity meant something, and uh, fortunately as I matured and grew older, then you know your ideas and philosophies and things change. Uh, my attitudes about schoolwork changed. In the last two years, I was able to make the, 
the dean's list, scholastically. My, my freshman's grades were anything to write home about, but, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but at the same time, even though we're athletes, we're on scholarship, we all were listed on the NYA program. And if you don't know what that means, that was the National, National Youth Administration Program. And the school got money from the government for us going to school. But after our seasons were over, we worked on campus. We literally got out and worked. We got 25 cents an hour wow. for trimming hedges, uh, digging clover off the football field with a kitchen knife, or doing whatever needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, so none of the athletes were exempt. We all literally worked for our education. Whereas now, these, uh, these officers would rebel at that. They, yeah. they would not uh, consider any type of menial labor in order to get their education. So uh, it uh, did well a very close bond for all of us were about in the same boat. We shared each other's clothes. None of us had automobiles. So we walked or hitched rides wherever we went. So uh, it made for a very close knit and a group that uh, has very much affection for each other till today. And fortunately, most of us made it through the war out of that class. Out of my, my class right before me and one right behind me, of course, the ones I was closest with. And uh, of course, we were all the first ones called up when the war came. And uh, so we all went to service in 41, the ones who were not handicapped. And uh, we served. Uh, what part of the service did you serve in? I'd like I, that in the record. I, I was in the Air Force. Uh, I served uh, almost three years overseas, went to the North African campaign, Italian campaign, and uh, well, we flew all over. I was uh, had the good fortune, or at the time I thought it was a misfortune, of being sent to Russia one time on a six weeks mission. Uh, at that time, it was a top secret mission that uh, probably helped to to shorten the war a great deal, I'd like to think. Uh, so, uh, and I also spent time in England and some time in France. So I was overseas for almost three years. All right, we're yeah. gonna get back with you in just a minute. Now remember where you are, you're in the Air Force, and then we're gonna hook back up to that, but let's get, let's get with Mary a minute. Mary, yes. we want you to look out into your camera and we want to hear about you and about your family. Start with your genealogy. Would you do that for us? My father was Henry Elbert Evans and my mother was Hetty Vincent Evans. And I grew up in Coleman County in a small town. Uh, we had a branch. I grew up on the ranch. My father was a banker. In fact, uh, he was in the bank for over 30 years and was president of the bank for 25 years. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the ranch and also working in the bank. And I went to school. Uh, I came from a small town named Talpa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to school all through my school in Talpa. Mm -hmm. And I went to Hardin Simmons for two years before we were married. All right, now do you have any brothers or sisters, Mary? Yes, I have two sisters and a brother. All right, would you like to name them? Uh, well, Everett Evans, and he was uh, worked in the bank there. Uh -huh. uh, Lucille Edens, she has passed away. Uh -huh. And Elizabeth Barnes, who lives in El Paso, and her husband is a college, was a college professor there. That's wonderful. All right, now here you've gone all through your small school. You've gone to Hardin Simmons, and I believe that's in Abilene, Texas. That's right. All right, and then did you live in Abilene while you were going to college there those two years? Yes, I did. Oh. I lived in the dorm for one year, and I had some aunts there, and I lived off campus after that. Did you have any special interest when you went to Hardin Simmons? Any particular subject that you were interested in you'd like to talk about? Well, I majored in homemaking, and mm -hmm. I've always enjoyed homemaking. Mm -hmm. And that was your favorite? That was my favorite. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, just I said we got married, so I did not get my Finish. Go ahead and fifth my degree. Uh, you got a degree in marriage, <laughs> and that's more important. Now tell us, Mary, um, how you met good-looking Mr. Amos that was with the Air Force and all of this other good stuff. Tell us a little story <laughs> about um, how you all met, maybe. Well, uh, I was working in the bank when mm -hmm. he was out 
that way for one year uh -huh. coaching. And I, uh -huh. I could, I met him through his bank account. <laughs> oh, that is wonderful. Uh, Which I might have to practice Neil. <laughs> All right, now. We, we coached for free back in those days. You didn't get paid for coaching. All right, now we have you in the Air Force, but somewhere between the Air Force and coaching, let's have that little bit of history. Let's connect that in. After you left the Air Force, uh, what brought you into the teaching profession? Well, actually, I coached one year before I went in. All right. I graduated from college in 1940. The war had not started as yet. All it right. was on the horizon, but so far, that's what happened. So okay. uh, then uh, as it became evident, they passed the draft law, and uh, so I volunteered for the Air Force instead of being drafted. So uh, I coached for one year, they went into the Air Force. Where were you coaching for that one year? I was at Taupo, where All she right. grew up. That's how I met her out there. All and, right. uh, so I was from there directly into the Air Force, uh, where I trained in California and Colorado and Arizona, then uh, uh, joined a 82nd Fighter Group, which is uh, to people who were interested in following these things, is one of the most, we had one of the most outstanding records of any fighter group in the European theater oper of operations. And uh, we still have to get together. So we just attended a reunion. We went over on the Queen Mary's in 1942, and uh, we just had our last reunion on the Queen Mary, which is, of course, in Long Beach, California. Now. Yes. So uh, there was a bond form between that group and myself, too, that's still very close. Mm -hmm. The ones that didn't get killed, we lost a, I lost an awful lot of good friends, especially in the early stages of the war. So then I came back, uh, I thought a little about staying in, because I'd been fortunate I'd gotten some promotions, and uh, uh, but I decided the military life was not was really not for me, and so then I decided to go back into coaching. And so I returned to my hometown coach, uh, mainly because my mother and father both are now elderly, and I'd been gone for, well, for four years in college, then a year of coaching, then five years of service, so uh, I felt like I was needed home, so they offered me a job in my hometown. Where? In, uh, at Jacksboro. And, uh, in the high school or the Yeah, school? yeah, it was, it was a high school. All I was, right. was a head coach and athletic director. And, so I took it, and of course, Thomas Wolfe's famous saying, you can never go home. Well, that's partially true. It's, it's not easy to return to your hometown. Teaching might be fine, but coaching is a- It's tough. In a small, especially in a small town. In a larger town, it's not that tough. In a small town, uh, uh, it's a uh, pretty tough go. And uh, I had a lot of good friends, experienced the same thing, and uh, we had a lot of good things happen to us, and there were some things that uh, were not quite so good either, mainly just just because you grew up there. that uh, People, over, they remembered you when you were still a little boy. That's it. And, uh, but it was a, a happy seven years we spent there before I came to Grand Prairie. Uh, and then from Jacksboro to Grand Prairie, Texas, and right. what brought you or who brought you to Grand Prairie, Texas? Well, uh, I understood uh, that building a new school out here, I, I knew I had been a good friend with a former coach at Grand Prairie named Tom Pruitt. Okay. We'd been in college together. Uh, he was a senior and I was a freshman. Also, another coach, Trinidad San Miguel, who uh, was a native of Mexico, and he'd have to go to service, so he coached here during the war while Tom was gone. Then when Tom came back, he took back over. So Tom left and went to Corpus Christi. And mm -hmm. I heard about the job here, and uh, I didn't know it until I came down and looked over and saw they built a new high school. That was the year they completed the new high school. and. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, those real nice facilities attracted me a great deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the proximity of the opponents uh, had gotten tired of riding those buses, 60 to 70, 90, 120 miles of school buses for ball games. So I thought, well, here we are close to, you know, six, eight miles over to Arlington, not much further to Irving. And so a lot of things about the area attracted me. And Who was the superintendent? Mr. Then? Chambers, H.H. H. Chambers. All he, right. He hired me. At the, time as uh, uh, here for the coaching staff. All right, and who was the principal at the high school when you came in? Uh, L.O. Turner. Okay. Uh, was here then. He stayed one year, then Mr. Bowles came up, Lord okay. Bowles. All right. And, uh, so, Bob. You stayed at Grand Prairie High School how long? 16 years. 16 years. So, uh, my son was coming up, and uh, I had some friends. Uh, that I had accumulated a 
gotten to know here in this area that, that coached their sons. And I talked to them about it, and none of them had anything good to say. He said, uh, Amos, you don't want to coach your son unless you just have to. So at that time, there was an opening administration, so I decided, well, it's a good time to get out. But at that time, I was getting up close to 50, so uh, coaching is kind of a young man's game anyway, especially on the high school level, in my opinion it is. Uh, even though I still had the enthusiasm for it, and many people have asked me, do I miss coaching? Well, even today, I still miss the actual coaching work with the youngsters. I do not miss the ball games. The ball games uh, uh, not bother me. Mm -hmm. I still miss working with the youngsters. Mm -hmm. So then I moved to the administration, and uh, that's where I stayed until I retired in 1980. And what did you do in the administration during that time? Well, that's another long story. I was uh, assistant principal at Adams for two years. All right. And I went to Fannin, your neck of the woods over you there, bet. close to where you live, for two more years. As principal. That's right. Then I came back to Adams as the principal. All right. And I went through the transition from the junior high to the middle school. That's when uh -huh. that transition came about. And uh, so then after three years at Adams, uh, I was, uh, well, offered a job, I guess a good way to put it, uh, as principal at Grand Prairie High School. And so I moved to Grand Prairie High School and uh, at, that was from 75 to 76. And I stayed there for just one year. I had some severe health problems uh, and uh, I just, it takes a healthy man to run a high school. And, you I, and I was not physically healthy enough. I'm sorry that I wasn't because I set some goals. And uh, the biggest disappointment was I did not live to, uh, or did not stay there long enough to accomplish the goals that I wanted to because I'd set goals for actually for five years when I took the job. And, uh, but after a year, I asked for a reassignment back to elementary school to try to regain my health because I had. Uh, had very, very severe health problems. And then where did you go? Well, I went back went to Travis then. All right. I spent the last five years at Travis, and that's, I retired in 1980. All right. Now, we're going to leave you a minute. You've gotten us to 1980, but we still have Mary back just following you around after you have left the Air Force. Now, Mary, tell us about your life between uh, Hardin-Simmons and up to where we are today, and tell us we want you to be able to name the family, give us your family, your children, and your grandchildren as you come along and tell us a little bit about uh, Mary and Amos. Well, after he came back from overseas, uh, we were married within about a year after that. Uh -huh. And uh, I uh, went to Jacksboro as a bride. Uh -huh. And we had a daughter there, Pamela. She is married now, Pamela Ellis, lives here in Grand Prairie. And what is her husband's name? Frank Ellis. Frank Ellis. Okay. And they have two children, All right. Logan Ellis, who is in Adams Junior High, and Meryl Ellis, who is her last year in Eisenhower. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, that's your first child. That was our first child. All right. And then uh, after we came to uh, Grand Prairie, well, we had a son and his name is Timothy Amos Turner. Wonder. And he has, his wife is, uh, was a Grand Prairie girl, Chris Pickard. Mm -hmm. And they have two children. All right. Uh, we have Clayton Grant Turner and Nicholas Amos Turner, who is not quite a month old now. All right, and the first one, is the first one in school? <clears throat> no, he's four age? years old. He's four years old. Yes. Oh, that's a wonderful age. And our son is trying to walk in his daddy's footsteps. I guess he's coaching. Where is he coaching? He's coaching in South Grand Prairie High School. In South Grand Prairie High School. Right. All right, so y'all have to get out and cheer for the Warriors like mad, even though you were a coach for the Gophers low those many years, right, Mr. Amos? That's right. You know, that kind of divides your attention, uh, doesn't it? Yes. All right. Yeah. And Mary, during those years, uh, you were a homemaker. I was did a you, homemaker. Did you belong to the PTA and do other things? I sure did. And room mother. And, and room mother. And all the good things that go with having a family in grade school. Our children went to school here in Grand Prairie. All right. Did you belong to any clubs or groups or church or... Uh, service clubs or anything? Uh, no, being a coach's wife really didn't, and a uh, homemaker, and watching after my children really didn't give me time to do much in clubs. Now in Jacksboro, okay. I was in quite a few clubs. Okay. okay. Now, Mr. Amos, we have you retired. 
What's happened since retirement? I hear you play a lot of golf and all that good stuff. Tell us, uh, tell us what a football coach that's retired does. Well, uh, basically, that's about it. Uh, a lot of people uh, suggested maybe I run for school board. Well, I felt like 40 years working with youngsters uh, and parents was enough. And uh, so I'm still very interested, but not very active in uh, any school organizations or anything. Now, of course, when I was in the school business, I was very active in the coaching association. I received some honors, uh, statewide honors, while I was coaching, and uh, which I was very proud of. But uh, since then, you hit it. Golfing, I'm not much of a fisherman. I am a hunter. I have bird dogs, uh, and uh, we have a ranch, pretty good sized ranch in West Texas. We have a house out there that we go out and stay. In fact, we're getting ready to go next week as soon as the first good frost hits. All right. So the rattlesnakes won't bite our dogs or bite us either. But uh, we do love the, the bird hunt, and uh, I do play golf two or three times a week. And uh, oh, then I'm a Honey doer, I guess. Yeah, honey doer. <laughs> All right. But, uh, no, she's not very demanding. She's been a, a lovely mother to wife, and uh, she did an awful lot for the youngsters. Uh, uh, things that people never knew about. But well, she take money out of her budget, which is pretty thin, and uh, feed youngsters who didn't have the really didn't have food, uh, and we had them in Grand Prairie as well as Jacksboro, and. Uh, I'd carry them out to the house and she'd feed them their meals. And, uh, well, she even sparred one year by one of our outstanding athletes. Uh, uh, his clothes and all about college visitation because mm -hmm. he didn't have the money. So uh, she was about a fine coach's wife as she could ever have. And, all right. And she kept me from going into private business on three or four occasions and also kept me from going into college coaching. I was offered four college coaching jobs and. Uh, after analyzing them, uh, well, I decided some things about college coaching I didn't particularly like. I would love the coaching end of it, the recruiting and all the things that go on. Went back then, now they're just coming to light. But it, it had happened back then too, and I just, I did not want to be a part of that uh, at all. So, but. Uh, you have I, one half minute to look right out into your camera and give the boys and girls a one-minute exhortation about how important it is to live a good life. One minute. Well, I think self-discipline, I think, have to be the first thing that I can think of that they must have in order to maintain happiness later as an adult. Peer pressure was a very pet peeve of mine, especially on the junior high level. Peer pressure can destroy youngsters in the early teens and later teens. And, uh, I fought that with a passion when I was working on the junior high level. I don't mean literally fought it, but I tried to counsel and correct and guide youngsters away from peer pressure. That's going to be a disastrous thing to a youngster. So self-discipline, uh, honor your parents, your teachers, uh, do as you're told because they're doing it for your benefit, not for theirs, and uh, then you'll, I think, be a productive person. Mr. Amos Turner, Mary Turner, y'all have been just wonderful to share your lives with us today. And we know that Grand Prairie has really benefited by your giving so much of your life to the community and to the schools and to the other areas of your interest. And we want to thank y'all very much for being with us today. We well, thank, thank you very much for inviting us, Ms. Jackson. Appreciate it. And this is Ruthie Jackson and reminding you that history is as we live and do.